And now our last session of the day, a just energy transition acting with urgency. Please welcome to, your, to the stage our moderator, senior climate change reporter, Bloomberg Green, Leslie Kaufman, the A in multi-platinum band AJR, and the founder and executive director of Planet Reimagined, Adam Met, EVP and chief impact officer, Salesforce, Suzanne Di DiBianca, and global head of sustainable futures at NVIDIA, Tanika Versi Walker. Oh, thank you, you guys. <laughs> Wish me luck. Hello, everyone. I'm Leslie Kaufman from Bloomberg, and it's wonderful to be here at the end of the day for the Nest Campus. Today, we're talking about the energy transition. It seems like we're always talking about the energy transition, but that doesn't mean we should stop. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act has done a lot to move public policy. We can argue about whether it's done enough or not, but it's certainly started to move public policy. But it's not enough. We all know that corporations and nonprofits and everyone needs to be doing something. So uh, I'm going to have our panel introduce themselves and have them talk about what they are doing um, in the context of their organizations for energy transition. Why don't we start with you? Absolutely. Hi, my name is Adam, and my night job is that I'm a musician, but my day job is that I work in climate. I run an organization called Planet Reimagined, and one of our most exciting projects is about the energy transition. We did a massive study to look at the oil and gas land in the United States. And I spent a lot of time in Congress as the Inflation Reduction Act was being negotiated, working with both Republicans and Democrats to try and understand where that common ground was. And that's why we named this project Common Ground, because we actually found some. We looked at oil and gas land in the United States and found about 18 million acres that were primed to put solar and wind on top of where there's current oil and gas leases. This has never been done before in the United States. And after getting Republicans and Democrats to agree that this was a good idea, the Department of Interior signed off and said, for the first time ever, we are going to start approving renewables on top of oil and gas. This in particular helps energy communities. Communities that are currently producing oil and gas for past peak production, we're giving them literally a new lease on life. And the kind of key number here is that from all of this analysis that we've done, just on current oil and gas land, we can produce 2,000 new gigawatts of renewable energy that has never been considered in any study about renewables thus far. And so we are building pilots now across Utah, New Mexico, Colorado, to ensure that we're supporting communities through this just energy transition. Exciting. How about you, Suzanne? What are you, what are you guys up to? Um, so thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for moderating the panel. Um, it's the end of the middle of the, what, second day, and so I know everyone's brains are kind of full. Uh, as it, so I'm Suzanne Bianca, Chief Impact Officer at Salesforce. Um, we work on the energy transition in a couple of different ways. The first is that we operate as a 100% renewable energy company since 2021. And what that means is we invest in wind and solar projects and some DRECs that I can talk about a little bit later um, that really offset the power that we use as a company. And we have energy reduction targets as well, pretty aggressive emission reduction targets. So that's one way. And then the second way, as the largest enterprise AI software company, we have the privilege of working with a ton of our customers in the energy transition, utilities, energy companies, startups, and we're really helping them as they figure out their digital strategy and how they can bring AI in to accelerate the energy transition. So those are two examples. And I just hosted a energy transition uh, breakfast last week uh, with about 50 people at our annual users conference, and it was amazing to see the connection between the startups and the utilities and the renewable companies. And so we're convener, I guess. You're a convener, uh, always important. Tamika, do you want to talk about uh, what's happening? And you, 
you're working with a specific aspect, right, of NVIDIA. So talk about your job and, and the energy transition through that. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Tanika Versi Walker. I work at NVIDIA, and I'm the global head of Sustainable Futures. Um, it's an initiative that powers startups that are focused on climate and sustainability. These startups are helping us solve the world's greatest challenges. About two years ago, um, I started working on this idea where we imagined what if every single company in the world was building a technology or innovation that was helping us um, get to a cleaner planet. And so I have the opportunity to work with a thousand startups in our startup ecosystem of 21,000 startups that are all working hard to help save the planet. Um, so when you think about those 21,000 startups, they are robotics, um, they're networking, they're healthcare startups. Um, two years ago, I realized that no one was helping the climate startups. No one was helping the sustainability startups. So my initiative is global in nature. And over the last two years, we've found a 1,000 startups that are doing things like um, fire detection, um, placing our embedded devices at NVIDIA in the Amazon to detect um, species that are potentially extinct or discover that a species is not extinct. So we're using technology to help us solve these problems, and I'm super excited to work with uh, entities like Tomorrow.io and FortiGuard um, and BugMars, uh, who are doing incredible things to help us save the planet. So great to be here with you all. Terrific. We'll talk a little bit about what it means to work with someone exactly, like how you support them. And, and I think you can address that in our next question, which talks about not just energy transition, but one of the goals for everyone was going to be a just transition, that we were going to bring all different types of people along. Um, you're working globally. Um, you're working in the nonprofit arena. When you, what do you sort of think of when you're thinking about keeping justness at the front and center of the transition? Shall I go first? Yeah, we're going to go this way. Excellent. <laughs> Sometimes we could go that way, but I thought okay. we'd just give everyone a chance to rest in between. Sounds great. <laughs> The energy transition being just is a key part of the entirety of the transition. And environmental justice, which I'm sure you've heard a lot about over the last couple of days and the last year or so, is key. And what we mean by that is ensuring that local communities that are participating in this transition have a voice and have ownership over the process. So I'll give you an example. In the West, where we're building out these projects, currently, Fossil fuels are the largest funders of schools and hospitals. The royalties that come from oil and gas are funding the classrooms in places like Utah and Colorado and New Mexico. As we're passing peak production of oil and gas, we need to find a way to fill those gaps to ensure that we're not losing funding for places like education and hospitals. The local communities, in many instances, make those decisions about how the funding is distributed. Yes, funding goes to the federal level, funding goes to the state level, but in a lot of cases, funding goes to the local level. So understanding exactly the needs of the community is incredibly key as we're building out these new projects. There's something called a CBA, a Community Benefit Agreement, which involves deep roots in the community, working directly with them to figure out everything from the design of the project to where the money is going to where the jobs will go. That's step one for us. So as we're building out our pilots, we are starting there with how the community can benefit from the ground up. Can you give us just one, like really quickly, one example of how it works? Because this sure. is very sort of yeah. general, but I'd just like to know. Sure. Yeah. So getting super granular, um, when we go in and talk to a community, let's say we're in a, in a community meeting, there's this really excellent way of talking about the design of these projects where you can literally give the community a bunch of different choices of what the project itself will look like, exactly what the fencing around the project will look like, exactly what kind of crops will be planted around the solar panels, exactly how the project will be lit from a lighting perspective. We give them a lot of oversight over the design. So as they're walking by, at these community meetings, they can actually check a box and say, I prefer this, or I prefer this. So this is happening right now in some city or some town in the US where you're out, out where you're rolling out a solar project and you're giving them a 
I just came from Detroit, and the mayor of Detroit last week did this at a community meeting where he had people check boxes deciding exactly what they wanted their solar project. And did that excite people? Were people into it? People got excited because they get to participate. It was, it was really fun for this community meeting. Okay, how about you, Suzanne? And we love, we love these specific examples yeah. like that. No, I know, I think it's great. And I think what Adam's talking about is like ownership and agency in the process. And I feel like that's really important whether you're in Detroit or whether you're in Rwanda, um, for example. And so when we think about our renewable energy investments, um, we do something that was called the DREC, which is Distributed Renewable Energy Certificates. And it's kind of a new program. We just piloted it last year. But 75% of these corporate renewable targets that we have and Apple has and many companies have, eight, 75, the high 70% of those projects are in North America. And the energy has to tr transition has to happen all over the world. And so what a DREC project is, is it's enabling small scale solar projects as one example, clean cook stoves is another example, um, on hospitals and schools. So you were talking about the fossil fuel companies fund that, which you know most people don't know about. But in the global south and in the developing world, they don't have the opportunity to work with big tech for an example in their renewable program. So we're trying to kind of crowdsource more funding to go to the local level. And you know, it makes a lot of sense for a hospital or school, they also save energy at the same time and get to power their community and provide light. And so that's one way we think about the just transition. Okay. And <laughs> do you have thoughts? <laughs> yes, I have thoughts. <laughs> With a thousand startups at the helm of, of this um, transition, I have many thoughts, but I want to focus on what is about maybe five or 10% of those startups. They are climate, weather, and ocean startups. These are startups like Tomorrow.io and Climasins and FortiGuard who are using weather prediction to help us save our physical, human um, assets and help us with food resiliency, right? When you think about knowing the weather in low coastal regions, it's important to help protect those regions from flooding. Um, it's important to understand heat waves in urban environments. That's something that FortiGuard does. All of these companies are using AI to power their technologies. And so my job, which I love, I wake up every morning just loving my job, is to help these uh, startups get resources. So to make it just, we don't want to just give our technology to generative AI startups or to startups that are doing robotics. We also want to make sure that climate and sustainability startups around the world get access to our technology because we do believe that they'll be a big part of help, helping us solve um, some of the challenges that we face. But I would encourage each of you that if you haven't uh, looked into Tomorrow.io and FortiGuard and Climasins, that you check out those startups because they're working tirelessly to ensure that people and all of the, the, the things that we share this world with, nature and biodiversity, are protected. So this question is going to be a little bit different for different people. You're from a nonprofit, so we're going to talk policy a little bit, and then we're also going to talk about, when we get to the corporations, how you navigate the policy world in a very partisan era. Um, but why don't we start with you? Um, the Inflation Reduction Act has gone through. Yeah. Are you focused still on policy in the US? You focused, are you globally focused? And, and what are you doing on that front? Yeah. Policy is key because it's a lever for accountability for all different areas of society. That's really broadly put, so I'm going to go a lot more specific. <laughs> um, when the Inflation Reduction Act was being negotiated, my academic background is on indigenous ownership of renewable energy projects. So I worked on those provisions within the Inflation Reduction Act. And while it is the most impactful climate legislation in history, ever. I really believe that it's only going to get us 25 to 30% of the way there. There is so much more work that needs to be done. And so many of the decisions around not just implementing the money that's uh, spending the money that's coming out of the IRA, but implementing additional infrastructure projects, energy projects, transportation projects are decided at the state and local level in the United States. 
There are so many bills at the state level that can actually move us forward just as much as the IRA has when they are implemented across these states. Whether it's something as simple as electrification of school buses or ensuring that power in municipal buildings is coming from renewable energy resources, there is so much that can be done at the state and local level. You ask about international. We have begun to take this approach of co-locating renewables on top of oil and gas to the international level. We did a study of a location in Ireland and a study of a location in Pakistan, and we feel that, especially in the Middle East, there's a really enormous potential to site solar, solar. on top yeah. of oil and gas land in order to help both the communities and the companies transition their business through this proof of a market-based solution that it is more profitable for them to transition their business to renewables than to continue to rely on oil and gas. Interesting. Suzanne, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit. You know, from the corporate perspective, you can see what needs to be done policy-wise, but it's not necessarily maybe your job to advocate. Can you advocate for policy within the corporation? And how do you negotiate the partisan nature of that in these days? Yeah, and I think a little bit Adam's underselling what he's been doing. In fact, I was with a politician friend of mine the other night, and I, we were talking about Planet Reimagine because I'm a big fan and, um, full disclosure, a funder um, um, through Salesforce. And they said, oh, I know that guy. He's in Washington a lot. <laughs> so I think policy matters a lot, particularly when you have big, hairy problems like the energy transition and permitting in the U.S., as an example very different issues in Australia, for example. It's much more transition-based. I've been learning a lot about this. But so policy plays a huge role, and bipartisanship um, is hard to come by. So I think that um, you know where Salesforce comes down on this is we uh, focus, we have a great government relations team. I'm so grateful for them. And we're pretty vocal advocating for policy change. And the um, SEC, when we were advocating for global disclosure, Salesforce was cited 15 times um, in the report that came out by the commission around advocacy for disclosure, transparency. You can't manage what you can't measure. So, you know, when we think that we can use our corporate power, um, mostly as a collaborative, you know, we like to go together with other companies in our industry, uh, you know, I, we're not afraid to fight for policy. We also are very active on nature. And so we have like policy principles. There's four of them. You can go to our website and look at them. So try to do everything, you know, you'll get nothing done. But if you try to do a few things, you can maybe help move the needle a little bit. Because NVIDIA is so key to AI and they are so linked, I'm going to change the question for you a little bit, which is as you think about spreading AI to other people, do you think about the energy burden that comes with that? And how does NVIDIA think about, I mean, I don't know, a way to think about it is like it's scope three emissions. Does it see itself as responsible for the energy that comes you know, with more and more people using AI? Or how does NVIDIA think about that? And how do you think about that? Yeah, thank you. It's a great question. Um, I'll approach it from the area that I charter. My mission is to help accelerate those 1,000 startups and ensure that they are working hard to help us solve the energy transition. One of the key ways that we've reached out uh, to government is partnering with the, global, the Office of Global Partnerships and the CCE, which is the Coalition of Climate Entrepreneurship. NVIDIA is a member. We did sign an MOU to be a part of that coalition, um, and we feel like we are key partners in ensuring that these clean energy startups get funding, get access, and get access to compute as well. And we do care about energy efficiency. It's one of the key things that we are focused on is ensuring that our product and our customers' products um, are energy efficient in helping us with this clean energy transition. And the Blackwell chip. I'm excited yeah, for the Blackwell too. chip to be released. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, do you measure scope three emissions or no? It's not something I can speak to because my charter is sustainable futures, but right. I yeah. can always connect you afterward with the book. Well, we're coming down to the end, and I wanted to give um, everyone sort of a final thought um, on collaboration um, and how everyone can sort of come together. Like, what are you telling people, even people in this room, sort of about energy transition and how to participate? 
for me, there's no creativity without collaboration because creativity comes when you bring together people with different areas of expertise and you get the one plus one plus one equals 15 effect. In the energy transition, you're talking about a systems-based approach. You're talking about how it fits into transportation and shipping, how we build things, how we make things, how we get from place to place. We're talking about where we're going to put new wires. We're talking about where we are going to dig things, where we are going to build things. All of these require completely different areas of expertise and require a huge amount of collaboration. And creative solutions are not going to come out of this unless you have real, true collaboration in the truest sense. Yeah, and I think for us, it's, um, it's like, what is your superpower from whatever your company is meant to do? And how can you apply that to make change? And who can you partner with? That's why, you know, we know software. So we can help customers, you know, digitally transform and be able, um, you know, to have whether it's our field service product or we have a net zero cloud product, we've been developing software that powers the transition because that's what we know how to do. And so I think, um, Tanika, what we have in common is this kind of invest in entrepreneurs. Absolutely. And so because we know software, we also invest in entrepreneurs that do utility optimization, for example. And they're, you know, they're software providers and then we can connect them with our customers. So. I just keep thinking for everyone in the room, like, what is your superpower? And like, just turn it up as it relates. So last panel of the day, last word. Here you are. Last words. Well, I'm going to tack on to what Suzanne said and our other panelists here. Imagine a future where every single company is empowered to build for a cleaner planet. And that's what you're mentioning. It's find your superpower and support those startups, support those ISVs and those partners and those big corporations to become cleaner and more efficient. And so that's what we're doing at NVIDIA. We are giving them solution architects and developers to help them use um, our technologies to, um, to help solve some of these uh, global challenges. So I think in partnering with Salesforce and in partnering with organizations like the State Department, We've made that investment, and if you know of startups, if you know of investors who want to uh, pour their resources or superpowers into this, uh, please reach out to me. I'd love to partner with you and um, ensure that those 1,000 startups have every resource available to them. Okay, and on that note, we will thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thank you.